Okay, everyone. So uh, the next speaker, Epson, is ready. Let's uh, share the testimonial for, to him so he can explain you about using Flexbeak. All right. <clears throat> um, hello and good evening. It's um, four minutes past five here in Barcelona. And welcome again to the Rose Developers Conference 2018. My name is Epson Guacro. And today we'll be looking at um, how to design robot behavior using the FlexB engine. So um, I'm hoping everybody has the project and that we're ready to get started, right? Okay. So um, what is the FlexB engine? I mean, before I begin this presentation, I want to make some things clear. Um, I'm going to assume you know how to create publishers, services, action messages, I mean, action service as well and then um, subscribers. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, we learned a lot from the previous class. So um, FlexB Engine um, is created and maintained by Philip Schillinger. Um, I've had the chance to actually talk with him before this class. And I mean, he, he's made a, a whole lot of inputs. I mean, that I'll be sharing with you as we go along. So um, FlexB is a user-friendly, high-level behavior engine um, equipped with a drag and drop behavior, automated code generation, runtime modification of behaviors, and behavior execution monitoring. And it also comes with um, some kind of adjustable level of autonomy, which I would explain better as we proceed downwards. So what is the aim for this class? This class is structured to introduce and bring you up to speed on how to design robot behaviors using FlexB Engine. Yes, and how are we going to achieve this aim? We're going to look at the basic unit of FlexB, that states. We will also look at the various container types available. We'll look at FlexB constants and FlexB variables. And then we'll be looking at parameters, input output keys, and finally, the autonomy levels. So um, without much ado, let's get started. What is a state? A state in FlexB refers to any class with this form. I hope you're following on my screen. Um, that what I mean by this form is um, inherits from the event state class provided by FlexB core and has at least one outcome. So, I mean, we can take the fail outcome away and then it will be a valid state for FlexB engine and also implements the execute function. I mean, you have this basic class here and it qualifies as a FlexB state. All right, so um, some things to take notice over here also is when you're creating a FlexB state, we, we can also pass in input keys and output keys and also parameters. I mean, when you talk about all three right now, it sounds confusing. So um, I think I'll better show it as we go, I mean, along the code. Let's also look at the state life cycle. There are six implementable events for each state. So looking at this diagram over here, um, we have the on start, on enter, on exit, on stop. I mean, the execute is um, the, the, let's say the while loop for the whole state that keeps running, I mean, by default at 10 heads, which you can change if your program requires much more speed. So um, the on start event runs for all states in your behavior. That's why I have behavior highlighted over here. Take notice, the on start. So if you have like three behaviors, the moment you start the behavior, the on start runs for all of them. And then the on enter actually runs when there is a transition from a different um, state to your, I mean, the present state that we're looking at. So whenever a transition occurs, on enter runs and then execute, as I've already said, keeps running, I mean, during the course of, the current state you're in. On exit runs when you're leaving the state to another one, and on stop runs for all your states when the behavior ends. So that's why you see it has a double, um, let's say, rounded rectangle with it. Okay, that's great. Yeah, too much talking, I know. Let's see states in action. Okay, so enough of the theory, let's see Flex be in action. So um, let's go to the Katkin workspace and get things started. All right. So um, you open a new terminal over here and then um, just navigate into the source 
of the Catkin workspace. So I'll be doing CD Catkin slash source. Um, I hope you can see my screen clearly. If anything, please put something in the chat and then I'll be notified. And now we're going to create a new um, FlexB behavior. I mean, in FlexB terms, we call them repos. So I'm going to copy this command control C and then paste it here in the source. Um, we're calling it TurtleBot because, I mean, for this demonstration, I chose to use the TurtleBot as a basic robot in ROS. And um, there's no need to append behavior to it because the FlexB widget actually appends that for us. So here yeah, we're creating a FlexB repo and then we're calling it TurtleBot. Hit enter and hopefully everything runs successfully. Okay. All right. So first things first. Whenever you create a behavior, the first thing you have to do is build your workspace. So um, here, what we're going to do is, that's only when you create a behavior. When you create a new state, you don't have to build the workspace again. So let's CD back into the main Catkin um, workspace, and then let's run Catkin make. All right. So um, as the um, workspace has been built, Let's go ahead and see the folder structure of the project we created. So you can go to, if I let me make my screen bigger. All right, you can go to the Catkin workspace source, and then you see what we created over here, turtlebot underscore behaviors. That was appended automatically. All right, so um, what do we have here? We have a folder that is going to contain your behaviors. I mean, the behavior that you create after you've do, and then another folder that's going to hold your state. And when you go further into it, I mean, inside of the source, TurtleBot, FlexB states, you see that um, it comes with two default examples for us, which is very well commented and you can go through them when you in your free time. Right now, I mean, I have only 40 minutes, so I'll not be going through them. All right, let me check if the build is, okay, the build is done. Okay. So what do we? What are we going to do? We're going to create a state. What's the purpose of this state that we're going to create? Um, this state is supposed to drive the uh, robot forward a certain distance. We will be passing in this distance. I mean, and when it and also it will be detecting obstacles along the way. So if it finds an obstacle in its path, um, we'll be returning a failed state. I mean that hey, there's something in my path. I cannot go on. Okay, and if it's able to travel this distance without any obstacle, that's when it's going to return a done outcome. That like, hey, I'm done with the task you gave me. So um, the class is going to have the following structure: we have the init, the execute, the on enter um, event, on exit, on start, on stop, and we have a scan callback over here. This is um, I don't know if you've been using subscribers, you know. Anytime you create a subscriber, you have to give it a callback function to be used in to, I mean, fetching data and passing it around. So that's what we're doing over here, but you see it further in the code. So without much ado, um, when our script starts, we'll be importing this over here. I mean, FlexB call, we're going to import the event state and the logger. The logger is just a wrapper around the RustPy, I mean, log um, class. So it's just for logging into the um, FlexB engine interface. And then um, FlexB also provides us with um, a proxy of classes. So for each thing, everything you want to do in FlexB, I mean, for example, publish, subscribe, um, call a service, send a go to an action server, um, FlexB already provides us with a set of proxy classes that we'll be using. So with every program that we look at, we will implement one or two of them. So in this program, we'll be implementing the proxy publisher and the proxy subscriber cached. All right. And as you already know, we'll be publishing to the command veil and the message type is twist. And then we'll be also fetching the scan data, which is um, the laser scan. All right. In the init, um, like I already said, this class here, we're using um, parameters and then outcomes. So this class is returning two outcomes, field, and done. And it's going to take three parameters. Um, you should note this word very carefully. We have parameters, input keys, output keys. They are very, very separate and different. 
So I mean, take notice. So um, speed, travel distance, and obstacle distance. And here we're just doing the basic initialization. Also, one thing to take notice when you're creating a FlexB state is that you should store your topics in a variable because, I mean, anything you do in FlexB, I mean, if you are using the proxy classes that I mentioned, you have to reference the topic you want. So um, these proxy classes have this structure. They take a dictionary. And a dictionary, what is it? The key is the topic um, that you want to access. And then in this case, we're using a publisher. So the value is the message type. So just in case we were accessing more than, we were publishing to more than one topic, you can continue here, say some topic, and then you just pass its message type, message type. So this is like a very easy way to create a publisher without I mean, creating one publisher for each topic. Um, it just bundles the whole thing up for you and um, makes things easier. I mean, makes life easier using um, FlexB to create your states. All right, then we also create a subscriber cached. I mean, I would really like it if the name was just proxy subscriber, but then that's it, subscriber cached. It's because it buffers the messages for you. So um, it also has the same structure like the proxy publisher. The key is the topic and then the message type. OK, but one thing with a subscriber cache is you also have to pass it a callback for each topic that you want to be subscribed to. So what we're doing here is um, we're calling the instance that we created and we're setting the callback for this specific topic, the scan topic. And that's why I said it's very essential to be storing your topics in a variable. All right. So then we pass in the function we want to use as a callback, which is the scan callback. OK, great. Let's look at the scan callback before I mean I proceed. So the scan callback, what it's doing is um, getting the incoming laser scan data and then storing them in this variable, self.data. And that's, that's what it's doing, nothing else. Great. So what do we have here? Um, in the execute function, first, let's go to the on enter. If I mean, you've been following closely, um, I omitted to read all these lines because I mean, <laughs> you could read them in your own time. But um, there are some recommendations that have been made, I mean, by the FlexB team that says um, primar primarily the on enter is used to start actions, which are associated with um, a state or I mean, initialized variables. So, I mean, each state has a plausible recommendation that you should be using for it. So um, on exit, you can use it to stop possibly running processes started by on enter. So for example, if you on enter, you sent an action go on exit, you can say, hey, cancel that action, we're moving to a new state. I hope we're following. And then on pause, actually on pause is triggered, um, on two occasions. That's when the operator pauses um, the behavior in the user interface. And then when execution is paused automatically because of a priority container becoming active, we'll look at some of these um, instances as we go down. All right, so um, in the on enter, what we're doing is we're creating a message, the twist message type. And then we're setting the linear x value to the speed parameter that we'll be passing. And then we're also making sure the angular z value is set to zero. And then let's go back to the execute function. So in the execute, what are we We check, hey, was the variable, the message type created, cmd underscore pop? If it wasn't created, let's return a failed, I mean, outcome. Hey, you didn't create a message. We can't do anything. Let's return. And then if it was created, what are we going to do? We're going to log the obstacle distance. Remember, we're passing the um, laser scan into this variable called self.data. Then we're getting the ranges, and then the one at actually number 361, that's what is right in front of us. OK, um, so um, I just saw a question, why use callback? OK, uh, in fact, callbacks are actually the basic units for using a subscriber. And in this case, a proxy is actually, this proxy things we are using, they are dictionaries, OK? So if you were actually going to fetch direct from the dictionary, you might be fetching I mean, the messages of a different topic other than the one you wanted. So it's really advisable to use a callback so that 
the specific messages you want from a specific topic will be set to wherever you want it. So in this case, for example, if we had a different kind of topic, say some topic two, okay, then it has a different message type. How do you want to, I mean, fetch the message that comes on some topic? The only way you can do it is by setting a callback for this specific topic and then using that callback to actually implement whatever logic you want to achieve. I hope that clarifies things up. Okay, so um, the on start here, we are only just logging some information that, hey, this state is ready. And then on stop, we're also saying, hey, the logging for, I mean, the drive state stopped. We're just doing a basic log. I mean, you can do whatever implementation you want to do based on the um, project you're working on. So, um, but right now I noticed a bug, I mean, before, <laughs> but this was after I shared the project. So please bear with me. Um, the self.start, the self.start, um, this, this line over here, it's actually supposed to be in the on enter because like I said, on start runs when the behavior starts. So, I mean, it runs for all the states, but what we want to do is when this state is entered, we want to get the initial time. So um, just control X, um, let's get this one away. And then paste it in the on enter. I mean, after the, message definition so control v so it should be like this i hope everyone is making that correction Great. okay and then they should save it in order not to lose those changes yes yes save it and also save the project yeah yeah okay. all right um so continuing subscribe to that all right so um if you've been following this is how your entire class should look like so Let's copy the whole thing. And now let's move to the, um, the Rust Development Studio ID. So you remember this folder where we moved, I mean, where I was showing that the example states were stored. This is where all your states are supposed to be. Okay, so um, here, let's right click and create a new state. Let's call it go underscore forward underscore state dot pi. And then, here, yeah, let's paste the code that we copied. Um, before I even said, let me also make that same correction here because it looks like, yeah. Okay. So copy it and then paste it under the unenter function like this. So save. And before we start FlexD to look at how this on go forward state is going to work, take notice of this over here. Anytime you create a state, it's advisable, I mean, to use a Python string on top here to actually document what your state is going to do so that in the engine, anytime you click on your state, you get all this, I mean, representing whatever state you're looking at. You don't get confused and all that. All right, so we have some specific um, syntaxes that we use over here. For example, it's not compulsory, but then, I mean, it's a standard in FlexV. We use um, a dash dash to represent a parameter. And then we'll be looking at what we used to. And then we use a less than equal to, to represent an outcome. So if you see anything like this, you know, oh, this state has an outcome called failed. And then it also has an outcome called done. I hope we're following. All right, so now let's go and then, I mean, get some things running. So um, we'll be using the turtlebot. Right now, we, let's use the default turtlebot simulation that we have. So go to the simulations menu, scroll down, and then the last one, turtlebot two. Um, let's start. I mean, bring it up. No, 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 I shouldn't have, man. Anyways. What's the problem, Efson? Um, I just wanted to run Ross call before starting the simulation because we've been we starting it several times and it's gonna be a pain, but let's get going. <clears throat> okay, you have to know that Ross core is automatically run here by the simulator. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but anytime we restart it, um, the FlexD app will lose, I mean, its connection to okay. that. 
Yeah. So then the best option is to run ROS core in one shell. Yes. And just keep it. And then the the simulation will take that ROS core as the main ROS core. Right. Yeah, you cannot do it because the simulation is running. So I'm um, closing it or ten or yeah, close, exit. Close there. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm still seems Oh yeah, there. it's true because the simulation is still there. Okay. Anyways, we can deal with this. No, no problem. <clears throat> okay. So with your simulation running. Yeah, because at present we don't have still a, an option to close the current simulation that is running. We don't have that option. Here. Okay. Okay. No problem. <clears throat> All right. So with your simulation running. Um, this is what we're going to do. I might need I need you guys to really pay attention here because we're going to be skipping some of these commands and then we'll come back to them as we proceed further. So we're we're skipping the the first command, the second command here, and we're using this one, the second one. I mean, we're going to source the Catkin workspace before you start the Flex B app. That's what you have to do. So in a new terminal, just copy this code over here, Control C, and then paste it All right so when it returns you mean to bring the flex b app just copy the ross lunch flex b app i mean the full lunch so control c again and then paste it okay so where is my simulation oh there it is let me drag this to the side yeah so everyone should be looking at interface looking at an interface that looks something like this Great. Um, no problem. All right. So go to the tools menu and then open the graphical tools. Um, it's advisable to click on this icon here to open it in a new window so that we can have, I mean, a bigger interface to explore. So just click on this and you can close the one you opened here. So this is what I mean. You log in and this is the FlexB, I mean, app interface. So far, so good, right? <clears throat> So let's switch to the state machine editor. All right, but before we do that, actually, uh, make sure your project is selected here, the package that the repo that we created. So Tetherboard FlexB behaviors. Make uh, sure. One second, Epson, can you uh, repeat again the process for getting to that window that you have there? Sure. So um, the process is you go to tools, you click on the graphical tools, and when it opens, you click on the first icon over here. That looks like two overlapping rectangles. And it actually creates a new window with um, this interface on full screen. That's what I'm doing. OK. OK. <clears throat> All right. So um, let's create a new behavior. And let's call this um, simple go forward. <laughs> yeah. And let's give it some description. Um, enables the robot to go forward. And then you can give it a tag. A tag is just used here for, I mean, let's say you have a lot of behaviors it's just for quick, I mean, search purposes. And then the author is actually necessary. So um, set the name of the author. In this case, I'm using Epson. You have to use your name. <clears throat> and now let's switch to the state machine editor. So here, we're going to add in a state, the state that we created. So we'll go to Add State. And you see here, you can select the specific package where you want to pick your state from. OK, so I'm going to select the Tetherbird FlexB state. And you see, we have only one state created. I hope we are following. So I'm going to select the Go Forward. And then you can give your state a name. I'm going to say, I'm going to call this one Drive. All right, then you add it. Great. All right, so we have the drive state added, and then we see the three parameters that, I mean, we kept in the init function when we were creating our class speed, travel distance, and then obstacle distance. So we have to create variables that will be mapped to these parameters, I mean, when the state runs. So first, I mean, the next thing to do is switch to the behavior dashboard. And here, this is where you create your variables. So <clears throat> FlexB presents us with um, variables and constants. Um, I hope, I mean, we've all been programming and we know the differences. 
So if, if and only if um, whatever you'll be doing is not going to be changing, you can create a constant over here. I mean, give it a name and set the value for the constant and just click add, and then you can map it over here. But when you use variables, what you're doing is giving whoever is going to operate your behavior control before the behavior starts, they can change some parameters as and when they desire. So let's set the type to numeric and first let's create the speed. So I'm calling it my speed. Then you click on add. You also have to, if, um, to change the default value for my speed, change, click on the pencil um, icon over there. And in this case, I'm going to keep it between a range, the ranges of zero and one. And I want my robot to travel at say 0 0.4 by default. So when the program starts, you can actually change this. Let's also create another one for the travel distance and then obstacle distance, all of the type numeric. So um, we're gonna call this travel distance add. And then I'm also keeping this between zero and one and I'm setting this to say 0 0.3 by default. And then let's create the last one. I'm calling this obstacle distance. Okay, and then I'm um, playing with this simulation for a while. I, re I realized that um, um, a distance of 1.5 from the obstacle is actually a safe distance. So let's set the maximum to two and then the default value to 1.5. Um, I hope we are following. Okay, so now let's switch back to the state machine editor. And then over here, you, if you, your state is not selected, you can click on it for this panel to come up and then start typing. Um, the parameters you want to map to this, I mean, the class um, parameters that we have here. So my speed, and you see it comes up over. So just hit enter and I mean, fix it in. You also start typing travel distance, you hit enter and then you fix it in. And then the obstacle distance, you hit enter to fix it in. After that, make sure you click on apply to, I mean, apply the changes you're making here. You can click on close to close this panel and now we have to connect the states because right now, if you try to save the behavior, you get an error that says um, state machine has no initial state. Yep. So here, this is where the initial state comes from. They click on it and then click on your state. And then now let's map the outcomes. I mean, the field and the finished outcome. So if the drive field return field, and then if it passes, let's return finished. So now let's save the behavior. Always remember to save before you do a runtime control. It's very important. Okay, so let's go ahead and see the state in action. So click on runtime control to switch to the runtime control interface. So what do we notice here? The variables we created, my speed, travel distance, obstacle distance. Actually, you can change this over here before you start execution. So this was, this was what I meant by the differences between a variable and a constant. All right, so far so good. Let me check, okay, my simulation is still active. Now let's click on start execution. And if everything goes right, um, the robot should start moving forward at a speed of 0 0.5, I mean, meters per second. So we say starting behavior and driving forward. So, oh, that was too quick and it stopped anyways i hope um everyone had this i mean it stopped because in the code we are saying when the robot reaches i mean um, an obstacle with a distance less than 1.5 is supposed to return a failed state so it failed and then the drive returned ended and then stopped so far so good i hope all right now let's look at another kind of um i mean script or behavior that um, also introduces a new concept or a new proxy class. That's what, I, let me say that. All right, so this is what I've been explaining so far. You can, I mean, <clears throat> take your time to read them probably after the conference or when, I mean, in your own free time. Okay, so now let's go to um, other container types and parameter mapping. So. Um, if you've been following so far, what we've done 
in the state machine editor this by default this is a container and this container is a state machine a simple state machine from one state to another but then there are um, other types of containers that flexb provides okay um i think i'll talk about this i mean as we go on further so before i continue actually um when i spoke with philip he made some recommendations i mean on some questions that people keep asking him regarding when to use parameters and when to use um, input keys or output keys and i just i mean i copied and pasted his reply right here that was parameters are meant for choosing static values to allow for more flexibility than hard coding these values and then user data is for dynamic values which might change during behavior execution which are in the core of the state functionality yes that's a lot of english um we'll see how i mean that actually pans out so the next class we'll be creating um is actually going to introduce the action client proxy to us so right now what we're going to do is um, let's restart our simulation the same one that we have running over here so that i mean the robot can go back to its initial post wherever it was great and also before we actually create this state this is what you have to do remember to do this we're going to um be running the server that we'll be connecting to i'm calling it the spin server but before you run it also you remember the two function the two commands that we skipped um at the beginning yeah these two simulation yeah actually so you have to source the simulation workspace because um we created custom messages that the server will be using and then if you don't source it you know what happens so um copy this um co command over here and i uh, yeah i realized there's a mistake there should be source it should be like this source then simulation workspace yeah okay great <clears throat> so control c to copy and then in a new terminal just um okay this isn't a new terminal okay so it should be like this your new terminal should be looking something like this so just do a control v to paste it here and then source the simulation workspace once you're done with sourcing the simulation workspace what you're going to do is now you have to start the server so you copy um, the rush run vision follower spin server and then you start it okay so what is this next state that we want to create oh you say spin server started great the next stage we want to create is actually um going to help the robot turn i mean in the course of our behavior let's say we pass it hey 10 make a 90 degree 10 then the robot makes that 10 for us but then how are we going to do it we have an action server that actually is waiting for some goals so the goal is actually um the turn angle and the speed at which it should turn so we'll be using the action client as i mentioned earlier so let's move down to the code and then um if you paid i mean really good attention in the first um, script that we look at we looked at you see that this code has the same structure but then the only difference here the only difference is that we are using this time the proxy action client i mean all from the flexb core.proxy i told you i mean um, flexb gives us um, a bunch of classes i um, for dealing with services actions publishers and subscribers so we're using the proxy action client all right <clears throat> so in the on enter what we're doing is we create a goal we create a goal in the on enter okay and then what we just we create it we make ready everything and then we have this self dot error which is not compulsory but then i mean for my sanity sake <laughs> yeah i mean i'm using this value to check hey was the goal created if it wasn't then here when i mean we create a goal and then we try to send the goal in the on enter but if this fails that's why we're using a try catch over here if it fails we're setting the error to true so that i can determine that hey this thing failed 
in the on execute before the execute starts and then we say hey i couldn't it couldn't send the go terminate the state all right so we're doing the same thing like we did before but then also in the on exit what we're doing is we're checking if the client has any result i mean if it's still running if the action server is still running then we cancel it and then we log some information out that hey we canceled the um the goal that we sent and um if you if you read um the earlier explanation given to the events you see that the on exit and then on stop actually it's recommended to implement them kind of the same if not ex similar if not the same actually so uh, here i'm just copy pasting the same code in the on exit and then in the on stop okay cool let's go to the execute function what are we doing we're checking the truth value that we're using the error hey was there an error then return field if there wasn't an error what we're doing is we're checking um does the client has a result for us because i mean if an action runs it has to return a result so if there is some sort of result we're storing it here we're getting it first and then we're storing it in the result val and then we check in, hey, was the result um, equals to done? If so, then return done. Hey, we did the turn successfully. If not, we return in failed. Hey, this failed really, really terribly, and then you have to do something about it. All right, furthermore, further on in the same execute function, what we're doing is we're also checking, um, is there a feedback from this action server? If so, then get the feedback related to the specific topic, as I mentioned earlier, in flexb anytime you're using a topic you have to make sure it's a variable because you'll be using it over and over again good all right so um we check in if there's a feedback and then we log in the feedback in, in our console so um let's copy this class and then create the script in the um ros ds <clears throat> interface so here on the same title but flexb states right click and then create a new file. I'm going to call this 10 underscore state dot pi. Double click and then paste your code over here. Um, remember to save it, it's very necessary. You have to save it. Also, one thing to notice anytime you create a new state, um, the running instance of FlexB, the FlexB app doesn't know that you've created a new state. So you have to actually close it and restart it again. Um, I spoke with Philip about this and he says probably in the future there will be some kind of function to actually synchronize with the um, folder that you're using the I mean the tetabert flexi state. So for now what we have to do is just control C and then restart <clears throat> the flex B up again. So now you hit enter to start the flex B up. <clears throat> we are two minutes to finish. Excuse me. We are about two minutes to finish. Oh, okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's say five minutes. Five minutes. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So um, just like before, make sure the Tetris FlexB um, behaviors is selected, and then let's load the behavior we created earlier. We just call simple go for it, right? <clears throat> now switch the state machine editor. And then let's add in the state we created. So um, what was it? it? Was ten? Yeah, ten state. So you click on it and then give it any name you want. I'm calling this a ten. You add it over here. And then um, this is what we're going to do. Um, we know that the distance at which um, the robot is situated right now is going to fail. I mean, it can't cover the distance, the travel distance that we want. So let's connect the fail outcome actually to the next stage that we want to run okay all right and then if it turns successfully let's return finished and if it fails let's connect it to the fail outcome all right what do we know we know this state also requires two parameters the turn angle and the turn speed so let's go to the behavior um dashboard and then we do the same as we've been doing let's call this turn angle add it and let's keep, for the purposes of this code, we're keeping it between 90, negative 90 and 90 degrees. And by default is zero. All right, 
Then we also create a turn speed. So turn speed. All right, you add it in. And then let's keep, let's say this to be 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is too much. Let's use 0 0.3 so that we see the robot in action actually. All right, back to the state machine editor interface. You just go here, start typing, and then hit enter to apply. And then here we're also using the turn speed. Remember to click on apply. And then um, remember to save your behavior. All right, let's go to the runtime control interface. And you see the new variables we created are showing up over here. So what angle do we want the robot to turn when it encounters a failure? Well, let's make a 90 degree turn. So you can enter that 90 over here. And now let's start execution. So I'm going to go to the interface. I'm going to see this actually happen. You see, when it gets there, it, it I mean, recorded a failure, and then it make that 10 for us. So if you've been following, I'm sure you also got the same exact feature happen for you. Yeah, great. Um, man, this five minutes. Is not... <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. okay. about, about to finish. Oh, please, please, yes. <laughs> All right, so um, there are other container types. We have the con priority containers and the concurrency containers. I mean, the concurrency allows you to run I mean, multiple states at the same time. And then the priority containers, they're actually like the state machines we've been using. Just that the only difference with them is that um, they have some sort of priority to them. So if there are two states and there's that priority container, the priority takes over, I mean, runs before whatever states you have in your interface runs. So um, to see this in action, let's do this very quickly. I've already implemented this behavior. I just want you to look at it. And then, I mean, you can look at the details of it when we're done. So let's do control C to close the app. And then over here, I mean, remember we have the action server running. You can also, um, you have to terminate it because the next launch we're doing is going to start a new action server. Now, we are not launching the turtle, but to go to select launch file and then select the main dot launch and then click on launch to bring it up. Okay, so if everything goes as planned, you should be looking at an interface like this. This is actually an algorithm that uses color detection and then it was the perfect example for this class because um, I mean, you just have to implement it to move from one state to another from one color to the next color. So let's see, let me go back to the interface and oh yeah, I have it here. So um, let's bring up the FlexV app again. And now since this behavior is already implemented, we just go there, I'm just going to explain, I mean, how the whole thing was connected and then you can um, look at the, base, the details later. So let's load behavior and select color detection. Yeah, that's a lot of parameters, I know. Okay, let's go to the state machine editor. And what do we have here? We have um, a state called delay before run. It's a generic state. It's there in flex when you start it. And then we have a container, and this container is called concurrency. So inside this container, it's a concurrency type of container. You see, we have two different states here. We have the drive forward, and then we have the um, a bus mach state machine here. Well, in the bus machine here is a priority container. Let's look at what, do we, what we have in the boss machine. Um, double click to get inside and you see that it's just um, a sequential state of, uh, sequential, I mean, matchup of states. I mean, from yellow line to red line to pink line, just that. But I mean, I use this to demonstrate the concurrency because anytime it enters this container, even though the robot is supposed to drive forward, it will rather run everything in the boss machine before returning to run the drive forward. And one thing to notice in the um, concurrency container is that when you connect the outcomes, for example, if I select this and then connect them to the same outcome, what this means is it's an end. I mean, truth table. What this means is only return if this state has finished and then this container has also finished. But um, for these purposes, we are not doing that. And the default one like this, what it's saying is, if this state's finished first, hey, return. I mean, get out of the whole concurrency state, move on to the next thing. So um, let's save, go to the runtime control. And then, mm, let me see. Um, 
travel distance 0 0.8, that's okay. So let's start execution and let's see if everything goes as planned. Um, the robot should, I mean, start doing some image, sort of image detection and then moving <clears throat> along. So it says drive stage ready, right? And you see that the whole um, execution has paused because it's waiting for um, an operator to actually tell it to move on. This is the autonomy level I was talking about. Right now, if I click on done, then it transitions to the, um, the next state that is supposed to go in and then it does what it's supposed to do. So how did I implement this? You look in the state machine editor, let's go to the root. And then you see, um, click on this state, and this is how I change it. You see, autonomy levels, you can change the type over here. But here I'm using a low level of autonomy. So <clears throat> in your runtime control interface, if you want to detect autonomy levels, this is what you have to do. Um, let's say if I selected no, it means even though we've set autonomy levels, it's going to ignore it. But then let's say you have so many autonomy levels in your, um, in your whole behavior setup. Anytime you use full, it means you are giving the robot full autonomy. It shouldn't ask the operator for anything. But here it was set to at least low. So when it encountered a low autonomy, it had to wait for the operator to tell it, hey, go ahead and do what I want you to do. So you can now toggle back to this interface and then see that the robot, I mean, has been doing a good job <clears throat> following, uh, I mean, the color <laughs> detection algorithm that we created for it. So um, I think my time is like way up and please send in your questions and then I'll do my best to answer them for you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Epson. Thank you very much. An applause for you. Thank you. Thank you. That was an amazing, amazing uh, explanation. I mean, the subject is super interesting. And it's super long, so I'm <laughs> sorry that we ha we are short in time. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah. anyway, so thank you very much for that extra explanation. And for all the attendants, remember that you have all the code, all the explanation on the project that you have, so you can review afterwards by yourself. Yes. Now, let's go for the question. So um, let's go to the support team and see if they have any question here for you. Let me see. So uh, here we have a question, uh, Epson for you from Travis and he mm -hmm. say, it's not totally clear to me how to get FlexP launched in a new window. I know he went over it, but I miss it. All right. Um, let's see. My interface seems to be frozen. I don't know why. Um, let me refresh it. No, it's moving. It's showing the simulation. Yeah, but I mean, it's not responsive right now. I'm trying oh, to minimize okay. it, but it's not responsive. <clears throat> okay. okay, so let me try to explain it verbally. I will well, maybe... you, you have there a, a thousand tabs, so maybe <laughs> it's <laughs> so maybe, you run out yeah. of memory or something. Yeah, so um, you go to the tools menu and then you see an option called graphical state, um, graphic tool, I guess. Yeah, graphic tool. So you select the graphic tool and you see that it has this, I mean, option over here. I mean, two rectangles overlapping. You click on that rectangle and then it opens it in a new tab for you, like we have over here. All right. I hope that makes things clear. Okay, so Travis, if it's clear, if it is not clear, please uh, just uh, do state the question again or, or where is not clear. So uh, let me see for more questions for you, Epson, and then, Tick is asking, I just copied my question from about how does FlexP compare to Smash? Is it a competitor or do both end different applications or approaches? Okay, um, that's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> myself, when I started using FlexP, I was asking myself the same question. And then um, I realized it's just FlexB is actually an advanced form of Smash. It's built on top of Smash, okay? So um, what we're looking at is, let's say we have the basic Smash, but then FlexB is like the superpower of Smash. I mean, the same developers, those who develop Smash, Flip is actually part of the team that developed the Smash package. 
And then he went ahead to make it super, super dope and good for the <laughs> like, yeah. So, I mean, if you've been using Smash, you see that how to, I mean, do the input output keys are exactly the same as we're doing in Flex the State. I don't know if you, any of you noticed that, but um, yeah. Okay. Okay, and uh, one question: Is this FlexB generating any code in in Rust nodes, uh, so or is there some uh, Python code that is beneath being executed, but is actually not uh, organized into packages or into nodes? Or how how does it work? Yes, um, that's the um, automatic code generation feature in FlexB. So man, this interface is really killing me. I really wanted to show this. Um, so in the app interface, there is an option. Yeah. There is an option that you can view the code that has been generated based on the behavior you've created so far. Okay, can you sh share your screen with us or is it still blocked? Yeah, I mean, the whole interface is still blocked. Okay. I'm trying to restart my browser bar. So anyway, you, you say that there is a a uh, way uh, of generating code. Yes, yes. Based on like, the state machine that you have created. Yes, based on um, the whole behavior that you have. And you can actually make some changes to the code and it recognizes it for you. So FlexB works in this way. It has um, a feature called Onboard. And then it has a mirror. And then it has the main FlexB app. So the FlexB app connects to the mirror, which actually mirrors. I mean, the Onboard is what's supposed to be on your robot. Okay, so the mirror actually uh, kind of, <laughs> I don't want to use the keyword mirror, but then it mirrors what's advice on your robot to the FlexB app. And then that's the kind of communication that happens. You see a lot of topics if you did a Rust topic list. I mean, my interface is still frozen. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Okay, uh, let me check. I don't think that there are more questions. So yeah, so basically that's it. Thank you very much again, Epson. Thank you. Thank you.